Welcome to Fox News Black Report. This is a space where we bring you Black America's headline news, views, and opinions. I'm Romeo. Hey there, I'm Brooke. And of course, Demi is out on a well-deserved vacation. She is out today. On today's show, a Black Republican congressman feels he's being blocked from joining the Congressional Black Caucus. Republican senators just blocked a bill that could have increased your pay. And we're going to break down why federal officers will now have to wear body cameras. Also, judge dismisses lawsuit against McDonald's by Black franchisees. Megan Thee Stallion offering full ride scholarship. Drake teams up with Live Nation and Shock G cause of death is released. Mm -hmm. We have all of that and much more. It's our voice and our truth. So let's talk about it. All right, let's get into our top story. A black Republican believes the Congressional Black Caucus is blocking him from joining the group. I'm talking about U.S. Congressman Byron Donalds. He says he and his staff have reached out to members of the CBC multiple times, but a spokesman for Donald says in return to those reach outs, quote, all we've got is the cold shoulder. CBC members have not spoken on the record about Donald's directly, but The Hill reports the caucus did send over a statement in that statement saying, the group remains committed to fighting for issues that support black communities, including the police accountability bill, protecting voting rights, and a jobs bill that helps our communities. Currently, the CBC has no Republican members, but black Republican lawmakers have joined in the past. The only other black Republican member of the U.S. House is Congressman Burgess Owens, and he has said he does not plan to join. So that is something we have seen in the past. Black Republican members of Congress almost protesting the CBC, coming mm -hmm. out and saying, I'm, I'm not going to join. And that, some of that's been part of like their uh, campaign speeches. You know, I'm not going to join this, calling it decisive, um, divisive, excuse me, decisive, calling yeah. it divisive. Um, Senator Tim Scott, right? Widely yeah. seen as the most powerful black Republican lawmaker. Uh, the CBC invited him to join when he was first elected and he said no, he declined their invite. So, you know, that's something we do see over and over, but uh, I wanna let you know what Buzzfeed News is reporting, right? So they have cited a source that they say is familiar with the CBC's plans and that source tells them the group is indeed blocking Donald's memberships. BuzzFeed News uh, reports that the snub highlights the divide between Democrats and Republicans, specifically since a pro-Trump mob stormed the U.S. Capitol and they feel, you know, put all of their lives in danger, put, their, put them in jeopardy um, during the certification of the current President Joe Biden, the certification of his presidency. Um, matter of fact, some Democrats have explicitly refused to partner with Republicans on uh, legislation since the mob attack, especially if those Republicans voted against accepting the election results. Donald's, you're looking at him here, one of those Republicans who voted against accepting those votes, voted to deny Joe Biden's win. And the argument from a lot of people is that the CBC is supposed to re reflect and um, protect the needs of black voters. And this is one of, at least Democrats believe, absolutely one of the biggest ways that um, people were fighting the needs of black voters to yeah. deny um, their votes. And, and that's what he did. And so that's, you know, could be one of the issues. So we talk about Mr. Donald here, who is a Trump supporter, mm -hmm. uh, who actually called out some names. He said he had met with at least three members about membership, and they kind of like just pushed him to the side. We're talking about Demings, Al Lawson, and Frederica Wilson. Um, do they really want him in? Absolutely not. I mean, this, this, this is a no-brainer. And I don't understand the push of why he feel like he wants to be a part of it, if because you know what you the movement is, is. Yeah, I think so. I think it's it's another way to throw shade on that, and mm -hmm. that's not a good thing. I mean, we're talking about a group of people that's trying to do the right thing for us, for our community, and he claims that he's in on that, he's for that, but yet some of the things that he agree with or so I say doesn't agree with, it's a problem. It doesn't add up, and I wouldn't let him in either. Just wouldn't happen. You know, uh, this is not uh, the only caucus that uh, has these sort of battles. Uh, it's not just the Congressional Black Caucus. The Congressional Hispanic Caucus, they have bylaws that admit Democrats only. Mm. Plain so, and simple. Essentially saying, if you're not a Democrat, you're likely fighting against our needs. And so 
I, you know, I think it's interesting. Yeah. It's all very interesting. But yeah, I, I am curious as to um, why. Well, they can keep knocking, but he's probably not going to get in. Yeah. All right. Two of the biggest names in the Democratic Party have split over one of the most vexing issues facing President Biden. Vice President Harris, on her first international trip since taking office, issued a stark warning to would-be migrants from Guatemala on Monday, saying, do not come, do not come, she said at a news conference. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez swiftly branded Harris's comments disappointing and pointed out that seeking asylum at the U.S. border is a 100% legal method of arrival. According to The Hill, the public disagreement is given an added twist because Harris is universally um, unversed. I'm sorry, universally assumed to harbor future presidential ambitions and a White House quest by Ocasio-Cortez. The leftmost charismatic star is also plausible, but more substantively, the dispute has spotlighted yet another fundamental tension between centrist and progressive Democrats. Had conversations with people, you know, since this statement was made. Don't and, come. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And... The big question is, is she saying don't come because we don't want you here? Or is she saying don't come because it's just not safe for you? Because I hear stories over and over again being here in Los Angeles. I know people for a fact where their family came from Guatemala, mm -hmm. right? And the struggle, the risk, what could happen, mm -hmm. how your life's in danger, how some of those people that are coming to America may be chased out of their country by the cartels. There's right. so many things to this that I don't think people were taking exactly what she's saying the right way. And, but also, you know, people have long said, we know the risk. We're taking this risk because this risk is better than what we're leaving. Right. We have to take this risk. And I think that's a big part of the conversation. And that's why, you know, essentially she's she was there. A big part of her message was, we are trying to make things better here so that you don't have to come. And people are saying, well, right, but until that happens, we have to come. And so the message is, was, it, I think also just saying do not come, it, it, that put off so many people. The reaction to that wasn't good. No, even, was again, we talked about even Republicans were, were, were saying we're mad because they were saying, hey, you sound like Trump. And you guys were mad when he said it. Yeah. So it just didn't go over well at all. I, you know, I also want to note that um, we have long said, you know, this would be the most progressive administration ever presidential administration but look the most progressive presidential administration ever is still pretty centrist right when you you know because you're comparing it to what's come before she had as a member of the united states senate she the most progressive voting record which was still pretty centrist because mm -hmm. it's being compared not to typical progressive uh, ideology but to the more centrist democrats right uh and so it's also you know I think a lot of people are taking this as if this was like a black versus Latin American thing. And we feel like we have to constantly remind people that those two things aren't mutually exclusive. There are a lot of black Latin Americans. There Absolutely. are, you know what I mean? Yes. Like you, and so there are a lot of black people from Latin America who cross the border. So um, that that's not, you know, what this is. This is absolutely a progressive versus centrist battle, which is something that existed long before if we were talking about Medicare for all, because that has been kind of one of the things that uh, the vice president has kind of backed down from her fight for Medicare for all. Mm -hmm. And her, the vice president, AOC, they feel completely different about it, at least right now, at least what they're saying publicly. And so this is another one of those battles. And I'm not surprised at all because of, um, you know, what they both say, what they both personally fight for and the ways they fight for things. Yeah. And then at the same time, she said, please come. We welcome you. You'd have people saying, wait, hold on now. Hold on now. Mm -hmm. Why are you saying that? We need to get things in order. What about the sit down she had when she was saying, look, we've been to the border when they kept mm -hmm. asking when she's going to go to the border. All right. Look, we've been trying to fix that situation since the whole Trump administration went there and what they did. There's, we're still trying to find the parents of the children that are still there. Mm. So it's a, it's a big problem, and it's not going to end anytime soon. But I just hope that uh, Cortez wasn't doing that attack to benefit from it later, so to speak. I don't think so. I Listen, I, don't, I think she knows how to work up her base. Mm -hmm. I mean, she needs to teach a class hmm. to other members of Congress, period, just because she knows how to talk to voters in a way that we've never seen before, right? How to communicate with voters. But I think this was simply about, um, they. I think that publicly they have expressed different views about what's happening. You have somebody saying, hey, the border crisis is a mess. We're trying to fix it. 
And you, you have her saying the border crisis is a mess because of the history of Americans intervening in Latin American countries mm -hmm. and how we've left those countries. And people are coming because they have to. And we need to be empathetic to that. Nobody wants to leave their homes. I think that's also like a big, a big argument here. Nobody wants to leave. Think about how hard it is for us to leave our little neighborhoods exactly. unless they're yeah, awful. You know, and, and our awful is definitely like, you know, super developed nation type of awful. Yeah. And um, it, people don't want to leave their homes. They feel like they have to. And, you know, she is saying, you know, we are going to do the work. Uh, sorry, she, the vice president, to make it so you don't feel like you have to and to, to help out and make things better. And the congresswoman is saying, but until then, we need to be empathetic and um you know, I, I don't think anybody in this situation is seeking attention. I think everybody is fighting for what they feel like is best. Yes, I'm very passionate about it as well. Mm -hmm. It's true. Yeah, all right. Uh, Senate Republicans have blocked legislation aimed at addressing pay inequality. This marks their second successful use of the filibuster under President Biden. Remember, the filibuster getting a lot of attention these days. The Hill reports senators voted 49 to 50 to try to advance the legislation, falling short of the 60 votes needed to overcome that procedural hurdle. The bill would limit employers when justifying pay differentials on the basis of education, training, and experience in wage discrimination claims. Employers would also be prohibited from retaliating against workers who compare salaries, also barred from inquiring about prospective employees' salary histories during the hiring process. The bill would also further direct the Labor Department to establish a grant program providing negotiation skills and training for girls and women. So let's talk about um, some of those things this would have eliminated, okay? So um, right now, we've, we've all had jobs where um, they give you a 30, 60, 90 day training period. You're right. training. You're doing your full-time job after the first, you know, day or two. But you're training, and in that training period, you're not making as much money as you will be making after 90 days, right? Correct. And um, a lot of people say that, hey, that's not fair. I'm doing the work. Already, right yeah. out the gate. Yeah. Also, I think it's just studies have shown <laughs> we know about the wage gap when it comes to women and men. We know about the wage gap when it comes to black people, Latin American people, um, white and compared to white men, right? Mm -hmm. um, so lots of companies have these policies. I've noticed, you know, over the years, lots of companies have these policies where it is against the rules to talk about your salary. And a lot of these lawmakers are saying, well, yeah, that rule is in place so that you guys don't start finding out who makes more money and why. That because part. sometimes the reasons aren't very good reasony. Not at all. Right? Not at all. I mean... And, and on top of that, when we talk about just the women in the workforce, you think uh -huh. about since the pandemic, what they've right. gone through because, you know, child care is closed or schools are closed and they may work from home temporarily but have to go back to work. But then who's going to take care of the kids? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the food bill at the house goes up. Right. You know, a lot of things really came to light during the pandemic. And it's important that they understand that. And that's why we need to get these dollars up so they do make sense for people to go back to work. But, you know, the GOP lawmakers continue to say this is a burden on employers. Really? We're doing the work. They're out there doing right. the work each and every day. So how is that a burden on them? Pay us our worth for doing the work. Think about that, though. If employers were banned from asking you how much you made in your job before, they ask you how much you make in your job before, you say, oh, I made $20,000 a year. They know they can offer you 70, but they're going to offer you 30 because they're, they're gonna, that's going to change your yeah. income so much that mm -hmm. you'll take it. Yeah. If, they, if they're not able to do that, that changes the field. If everybody is federally allowed to talk about openly how much money they make, people are going to start making, you know, more equal amounts of money because how you how do you explain some of these things otherwise? In a lot of instances, it's like, hey, well, listen, you make less money than this person because of this and this, but there are a lot of instances where there is no this and this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. And, yeah, companies and corporations benefit from that. So... I don't know. I think, um, you know, what? We, we, it, there's a huge push, you know, for women to share. share, your, share your salaries, help the other person out. It could help you out. Um, it, it, this is this is interesting because, again, and I'm going to bring it back around to the filibuster. Joe Manchin has, has said, you know, I don't care what the other Dems say. I th I'm not going to vote to eliminate the filibuster. And at the same time, Republicans are using it. But everybody has benefited from it. when you're not in power. You benefit from it because you get to stop 
the other party just going wild. It, you know, it's just, it's, 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 it's interesting because so he's saying, you know, democracy and, and, you know, when we're not in power, then we'll wish we had it. And I don't know. It's, it's, yeah. it's not looking good. Like, no, right. You know, if they keep constantly using it to shut down things that you even feel like we should have. It's hard to continuously make the argument that we should have the filibuster in place. Yeah. And then a lot of people out there just feel stuck because are you going to walk away from your job? Right, right, when right. you know you should get more? No, and then you even can't. if this became you, federal you law, stuck. bosses and managers, companies, there would be companies that would still tell you not to and you would be afraid to. Yeah. They, they would still say that these are our rules. You True. know, so. All right, so mates, federal agents will now be required to wear body cameras when executing search warrants or making pre-planned arrests, according to new policy outlined Monday by the Justice Department's second highest ranking official. Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco announced a change in a memo acknowledging the importance of transparency and accountability in building trust between federal officers and the communities they serve. While a growing number of police departments nationwide require body cameras, the Justice Department has long shielded federal officers from wearing them arguing they pose a potential risk to sensitive investigations. If you ask me, this is something that's definitely long overdue. Um, if you're doing your job right, you have nothing to hide. Uh, we've seen what's happened with body cam footage right now, and we know they've done the wrong thing, how it's not released or they want to hold on to it forever. It's just part of the system now. It has to be done. Mm -hmm. um, we know there are great cops out there. There are great police officers out there. But at the same time, we also see something almost on every other day or weekly basis mm -hmm. where there's not. So I think it's important that everyone have that on, and it should be mandatory that it's turned on the minute they're in a the situation. Body cameras play a massive role, you said it, in you know the public knowing what actually happened. A massive role mm -hmm. in the like it, it, it it's you know just even as a journalist how important body cameras have been in us being able to accurately tell stories yeah otherwise we have to go on this is what this person says this is what this organization says this is what this entity says and it, that's not always been the truth and the facts uh, it, you know we're just recently talking this week about um, US Marshals shot and killed Winston Smith jr. Mm -hmm. um, no body cam footage because US Marshals don't have to wear body cams they, they're not allowed to wear body cams now they have to. The U.S. Marshal Service has 30 days to come up with the policy about how they're going to put these into place. Again, that does not mean that we're going to get every piece of body camera footage. There are, right. There's still going to be that hurdle. What is released, when it's released, um, that is still going to be in place in different ways, depending on how what these policies, how these policies are laid out. But I do also want to note, and, and a little bit on the note of how important this is, um, the feds are much harder to prosecute when there's allegations of wrongdoing, much harder than um, different uh, state officials, right? Uh, I, I'm going to bring some information just quickly from, it was a joint investigation between the Marshall Project and USA Today, and they found no Marshall has been prosecuted after a shooting as of 2020, at least, so it's toward the beginning, it's the first half of 2021. But yeah. the, this investigation was done in 2020, and no marshal had ever been prosecuted um, after a shooting. No matter what the situation may have been, the outcome, and never. So, right. And so, um, also, local district attorneys don't have the legal power to prosecute federal agents. And the Justice Department can also shield them from any litigation. And so, this is another way of, you know, us, at the very least, having more facts. Yeah, we need more facts because yeah. they're supposed to serve and protect, but I feel like they're more protected than we are out very there protected. sometimes. I mean, so yeah. body cam is definitely necessary.